Good afternoon. Welcome to the Clinton School. I'm Dr. Ellen Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of International Programs. And here are some of our star students. Um, these students are from Class 8. And they're going to talk to you today about their international projects. Now at the Clinton School, every student is required to go abroad for a minimum of 10 weeks. And they work with the International Programs Office preparing to go abroad. Um, and finding projects that are graduate level work, that are public service, and that are work that their host institution needs, wants to have done. So the idea is that we're serving a need that the host institution has, not that we're going to, to save them or to, to, to necessarily teach them how to do some uh, particular task. So you'll hear some really interesting stories today. I'd like to introduce you to Jessica Boyd, Lindsay Coonan, Ashley Jones, Tyler Pearson, and Nina Veal. Now, I'd love to tell you all about their projects, but they'd prefer to tell you about it. Um, so I'm going to start out uh, asking them a, a set, uh, a question. They already know what I'm asking them. And then if, if you would just listen to their presentation, uh, and then feel free to ask them questions at the end of, the, of their, their presentation. So I will start with Jessica. Jessica, if you could give me a, or give us a, a brief description of the country and region that you were in and your project. So I went to Bogota, Colombia, which is in the Andes region of Colombia. So it is not warm and humid. It's actually quite chilly all year round because of the climate of the Andes. And I worked with Habitat for Humanity in Colombia. They're one of 10 organizations for Habitat that's piloting a new way of thinking, piloting a new strategic plan. And because of this, they needed help diversifying their funding sources. So what I did is I came in and created a training manual on how to write funding proposals or grants to help them better understand how they can get funding from a variety of different organizations, foundations, corporations, corporate philanthropies, uh, government, and other institutions like that. And I also created a potential donor database. So I researched a variety of organizations that could provide funding to Habitat for Humanity in Colombia and recorded them in an Excel spreadsheet so that they could have a quick and easy reference for who could provide funding when they needed it. Okay, thank you. Lindsay? Hi, uh, my name is Lindsay, and I was in Kenya this past summer, and I was working with an organization called Legal Resources Foundation Trust, and they work, um, they're based out of Nairobi, but they work throughout the country doing legal advocacy on a variety of human rights issues. They work in the prison system and also in the community. And my project really came about um, after Kenya adopted a new constitution three years ago. And when that happened, they, for the first time, had a Bill of Rights. And in that Bill of Rights, it introduced um, equality between men and women, and it prohibited discrimination. And a lot of things that, you know, we might sound familiar to us today. But the challenge for Kenya is that it's a country of over 42 different ethnic groups, where, by and large, when you think of justice or law, it's carried out by your local elder, not the courtroom. So this, um, there was a little bit of tension between this constitution and how law is actually carried out. So what I was doing was trying to get a baseline of how elders and chiefs, how they currently resolve disputes, and to figure out where the tension is between what's happening among different ethnic groups and what the constitution says. So I went around and I did six different case studies. So. Great, thank you. Ashley? I'm Ashley Jones, and I worked in Bratislava, Slovakia, um, so in Eastern Europe. I worked for Habitat for Humanity International, and I was actually at the central office that's the headquarters for Habitat Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So it's really the hub for, it's a big hub for Habitat for Humanity International. I worked on a project called the Relay Energy Efficiency Project. And the main focus of that project is to encourage energy efficient um, housing renovations across Eastern Europe. Um, it's just now um, taking shape. It's largely funded by USAID and they're also partnering with some local 
microfinance institutions. Um, and the way the project works is that they make loans to homeowners associations. Um, people live in communist style housing, so in these big block apartment buildings. And a lot of people on their own would never qualify for a loan that would allow them to put insulation in their house. So it gets very, very cold. Um, it's being piloted in Yerevan, Armenia, in Sarajevo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. And so, again, you're in these houses with no insulation, and it's very, very cold, and they're spending a lot of their money on insulation and on heating. Um, so my basic part of the project is that I constructed a baseline survey and a building selection methodology that would allow staff on the ground in these piloted areas to make good choices about what apartment complexes they chose that would allow people to be successful later on in paying back the loans and also in getting the results they needed. So there was a lot of um, on the ground research um, dealing with housing regulations, um, and also some of the financial constraints that the people faced in those areas. Okay, thank you, Tyler. My name is Tyler Pearson, and I worked with Heifer International in Cambodia. I think most people in the room are probably familiar with the work that Heifer International does, but for those who aren't, they do sustainable agriculture, and specifically they focus on uh, animals and livestock. And my project was a value chain analysis study and specifically with a focus on backyard chicken raising. 95% of the people in Cambodia raise chickens at their, at their home. And what Heifer wanted to do is to study the entire chain, the business chain, from the producers, from the people who raise chickens at their home, all the way to the consumers. And there's several actors in between. You have collectors, retailers, veterinarians, uh, feed supply stores, and things like that. And so what I did was interviewed everybody along the chain and mapped out the value at each step to see how much it cost the producers to raise chickens, to see how much it cost the collectors to collect them, where the value increased, where it was efficient, and where it wasn't efficient. And the goal was to find the inefficiencies and make recommendations for Heifer to help pr uh, improve the efficiency of the chain. And I traveled all over the country in Cambodia. I was in 10 different provinces. I traveled with a team of five native Cambodians, and they served as my translator and study partners. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, Tyler. Nina? My name is Nina Viel, and I would be remiss if I did not start by mentioning my fabulous partner in crime, fellow student, Clint, fellow Clint student, class eight member, Kayla Brooks. She's waving, yes. So Kayla and I worked collaboratively with the Nyaka AIDS Orphans Project in the remote village of Nyaka Jezi in southwestern Uganda, which is a country about the size of Oregon in East Africa. Now, Uganda has the highest concentration of AIDS orphans in the world with 2.2 million AIDS orphans, almost exclusively in those two provinces where Kayla and I worked. And so the Nyaka AIDS Orphans Project attempts to provide different services in order to better serve AIDS orphans and their grandmothers who are their primary caretakers. Most of our work centered around the Grandmothers Project, which was started in 2007, as an attempt to help stabilize the different communities through the holistic designs that NAOP starts to offer. So Kayla and I ultimately interviewed 94 different women working in nine different communities across two districts in order to provide the first glimpse of, in, of impact analysis to the organization. We really wanted to help the organization understand so that they could connect better to donors what the impact of the Grandmothers Project has been, the impact of it on the AIDS orphans in their homes, and the role that this group has started to play in the community. So Nina was our survey, Nina and Kayla were our survey queens, 94 interviews. That was pretty impressive. Okay, well Nina, I'll start with you. Um, can you tell us what your biggest challenges were while you were uh, in Uganda, both professionally and, and personally? I think Kayla Brooks will agree with me on this, that our professional and personal challenges were very intertwined. When I say this was a remote location, 
This is a very remote location. I'm from New York. I've never even been camping. And suddenly here I am <laughs> living at a guest house with no access to running water or electricity in the entire village. We were unable to even power our laptops. So let alone transcribing some of the material was very challenging. And then there were the sheer logistics. This is not a population that has a mailing address or a population that you can easily Google. So accessing these women, arranging the logistics in order to contact them. Uh, one of Kayla's favorite story is that um, after we reached a certain point in time where we had to travel outside of the village to interview women. And so for four days in a row, we got a flat tire because of the road conditions in Uganda. So we would be on our way somewhere and then just stop for several hours at a time while we waited. And it was just a normal part of our routine. So accessing the population, interviewing them. At times, we would walk for hours to try to identify one woman who's in a banana plantation that could span six acres of such. And we're stopping around in it very graciously, trying to identify her and find her. So those challenges made it very difficult to work professionally. In addition to that, there was the language barrier and just the cultural barrier of being an outsider in what is a very small community. And then asking very personal questions and attempting to get a really full picture of what it looks like. Thank you. Tyler? Um, for me, uh, like Nina said, some of my personal challenges were similar as far as the language barrier went. Uh, when I was traveling on the road, I, like I said, I was with five indigenous Cambodians that all spoke a fair amount of English. However, when they were together, they liked to speak their, their native tongue. And it was up to me to kind of instigate conversations in English. Um, and even then, it was still a challenge because it was, it was five to one. And so over time, that, that, became, that became kind of difficult to be sitting at a lunch table or a dinner table or a breakfast table every single day and not be able to talk to anybody. Um, so that was one of the major challenges for me personally. Uh, professionally, I think the biggest challenge for me was I was supposed to be looking at the production methods for the, the backyard chicken raisers. And they were all over the map. Um, there was, it wasn't uniform. Everybody did things a little bit differently. And it was up to me to kind of map this out. So you had some producers who would feed their, their chickens just a little bit every day and then not really do anything else after that. And then you had some producers who were very technical and had complete vaccination programs and uh, access to members of their community that helped them out. And then and had a very large flocks and so and you had everything in between and so for me that was the biggest challenge professionally was mapping that out and expressing that in a written document as well as i could now that challenge also became my greatest opportunity because i was able to do it in such a way that not only did i describe adequately in my opinion what the different stages were in production methods, but also I was able to show how the different stages in production methods were the, they became my recommendations um, to, to show the people who were doing more advanced levels of uh, pr production, I, I utilized their examples to make recommendations for what others could do to achieve similar results. Okay, thank you. Ashley, your biggest challenges. Um, like my fellow students, I also, um, there was a huge language barrier. Um, Russian is not easy, and Slovak is similar to Russian, which is also not easy. Um, <laughs> um, the grammar is um, extraordinarily difficult. Speaking is not as difficult as reading, but it's still, you know, it's pretty tough. One of the biggest challenges I faced was actually more of a personal challenge. You know, disclaimer, this was my first time out of the country to go to Eastern Europe. And so maybe that's the reason that, you know, my challenges maybe were different than someone who's maybe used to spending time um, in that area. But I never felt American until I left the country. Um, when here I think of myself as a Southerner or as African American, but I don't think of myself as being American. But um, after leaving, I realized that I'm very much a, I'm as American as Yankee Doodle and McDonald's. I am <laughs> American. <laughs> and, and so, um, and I never also realized, you know, you see things on the news, and I always assumed that it was propaganda, that no one really cared what goes on in America, but we just tell ourselves that they care to make ourselves feel important. But 
things, um, you know, me having, I really felt like I had to kind of be a spokesperson for my country, which was an interesting position because I feel like our country is so diverse. You know, like my view in the Deep South, I'm from South Carolina, I feel as different than someone from New York or someone from the Midwest, but I was having to answer questions about everything from our health care reform to why we have so many guns to why we have problems with racism. And, and because also I stood out, the minute I walked in, I am like the only brown person. And so everyone's like, where are you from? The minute I open my mouth, oh, you're American. And so then, well, how come you guys do this? Well, how come you guys do that? And I don't like that Americans do this. And I heard that you can go to prison there for, um, let's see, no, they were saying that you can get life in prison for a copyright violation. That was, and I was like, um, I study law, because I'm also in law school. And I'm like, I don't think you're gonna get life in prison for that. Um, and so, <laughs> and they're like, no, I heard it, I heard it. You know, and, <laughs> and so, um, that was just a really unique experience for me. Um, um, like being in that position. Um, as far as my professional challenges, um, first I had a great experience with Habitat. Um, the staff there were from all over Europe, but about half the staff were Slovak and everyone else were mostly from other parts of Eastern Europe. They were from um, Russia to Bulgaria, um, Macedonians, and so they were actually able to help me very often that if I ran across something I didn't understand, um, uh, like any language difficulties. Um, they also really helped me a lot in the work. My studies here at the Clinton School, I felt really prepared me professionally. Um, so really my biggest challenges were on the personal level of being the American in this environment. Thank you. Lindsay? Um, kind of similar to Ashley, I think that Part of my challenge in being there, and I should say, unlike Nina, I lived, uh, I lived in Nairobi, I had very comfortable housing, I adored my coworkers and the organization I worked with, so on many levels it was easy just to be there. And so I think because of that, a lot of my challenges related more to my project and to carrying out the research in a way that you know, I felt was effective and um, productive. And so uh, how it ended up, when I traveled around, although I was in Nairobi, to do the research, I usually traveled alone to more rural parts of the country. And when I would get there, I would meet up with a paralegal that had connections with the organization, and they would usually help translate for me. But inevitably, because I was the sole person from the organization, and I'm a white American, it was, and I think in every instance, there was that moment trying to overcome the perception that you are a wealthy American and why are you there? And why, why do you want to ask these questions of this? And, and what, you know, what's the outcome of this? And so really trying to figure out how to frame what I was doing in a way where I could get the community to understand the importance of it, but not from my perspective, but from thinking about, you know, why really is this important for them? And, and to, and to overcome just that notion that, that I am there and I should be giving money or you know, that there's all these other things that come along with being an American. And so for me, and I wish I could sit here and say I figured out by the end you know, the perfect way to handle that, but I didn't. And I think you know, early on, I made some very <laughs> silly mistakes. I think the first time I tried to organize a focus group with women, I thought, well, I'll provide tea. You know, that's something that's very common there culturally. So I thought that'll be, you know, something nice to do. And so I said, you know, I'm happy to, to provide some chai, which is tea in Swahili. Well, I didn't realize that chai is also a term, or when you say I'm gonna provide tea, it's uh, also used meaning you're gonna give money. And I had no idea on that. So, so things like that uh, definitely made me think a lot. And uh, I think by the end, I was able to navigate that fine line a little better. But I, and I imagine that's just a challenge that will probably you know, be with us whenever we do research in another country. But. Thank you. Jessica. I think my biggest challenge personally was the exact opposite of Nina's. I am from Little Rock, Arkansas, and I've only lived in Little Rock and Fayetteville for any length of time. And I went to Bogota, which is a city of 11 million people. It's a very well-developed city, um, but their public transportation system is not good at all. So navigating how I was going to get to work every day, I lived about an hour bus ride from my workplace. I had a little bit of help from my Colombian roommate on figuring out the bus system and that sort of thing, but 
I don't think that I ever really figured it out, even by the end. Um, it was very, very difficult to get around and to get to places that I wanted to go. Thankfully, my neighborhood had a grocery store and all of the things that could provide my basic needs, but I didn't have a car, and like I said, it's a huge city, so figuring out which buses took me to which places was really difficult and oftentimes scary because I would get on the wrong bus and realize I was on the wrong bus and have to get out in a not so great part of town. Eventually, I would figure it out, but that was my biggest challenge personally. Professionally, the language barrier was huge, and I didn't think it would be this way. I have a bachelor's degree in Spanish, which is why I wanted to go to South America. So I thought that I would have somewhat of an advantage in being able to speak the language and communicate effectively, but this was definitely not the case. The first three or four weeks growing that language skill that I needed to effectively communicate in a professional environment was very, very difficult. I knew all the grammar, I knew all the vocabulary words, but putting those sentences together and comprehending what people were saying to me because they speak really fast was very, very challenging. And this communication in a professional environment, you want to be sure that you have all of the necessary information that you need to continue with your project de deliverables, otherwise you may make a mistake that could end up hurting you in the end. So I really wanted to be sure that I heard everything perfectly. So this was a very big challenge professionally for me, but like Tyler, turned into a wonderful opportunity to grow my skills in this language, and now I feel very confident with my Sp Spanish speaking skills, which is wonderful for my future career goals. So I think that was my biggest challenge in the professional working environment, was just being able to understand what the organization wanted from me, and also being able to communicate to have friends and feel comfortable in this environment. Mm, thank you. Jessica, often when um, students go abroad, uh, it can be a, a life-changing event. Um, it can be trans transform your sense of, of what your role in the world is, um, what career choices you make, or coming from that experience, what are your pers professional strengths and weaknesses? Could you talk a little bit about, about your experience? I think that this experience has definitely helped me to understand better what I would like to do after leaving the Clinton School. Originally, I was almost certain that I wanted to work internationally at least for a very short period of time. However, living in Colombia and being away from my family for three months was way more difficult than I ever could have imagined. So I definitely came to the realization that I do not want to work further than maybe six hours from my family. <laughs> so, <laughs> That, that's a very big deal, obviously, and I'm very glad that I had a, an opportunity that's kind of short to realize this rather than maybe committing to an international job of two years and then figuring that out. I also knew before leaving that I did want to work with communi Spanish-speaking communities either here in the United States or internationally, and going to Colombia basically confirmed this. Um, I'm very interested in women in Latin America, particularly with uh, craftswomen in Latin America, and going to Colombia helped me understand that this is definitely something that I'm still interested in and still very much would like to do prior or post-graduation. As far as professional skills, like I said um, a couple of seconds ago, just the Spanish language skill was amazing to be able to learn this and feel confident with my speaking skills. But also just being in that sort of professional environment. Um, I went straight from my undergraduate into graduate school, so I've never really had a job where people are relying on me for something big. And this was a very big change for me because Habitat for Humanity in Colombia was very much relying on the results of my project to continue with some of their projects in the informal communities outside of Bogota and also across the country. So having that sort of professional pressure was definitely a life-changing experience and I think it definitely has prepared me for my future career. Thank you. Lindsay? Well, for me, uh, and I suppose I should say, like Ashley, I'm also a student at the law school as well. And honestly, I think before I went, I'd, I'd had some rather cynical conversations with some of my friends. And when I mentioned I was going to be working with an organization that deals with human rights, on more than one occasion, you know, the question will come up, you know, what, what does that even mean? You know, it's a phrase we use a lot, human rights, human rights. And I remember even being on the plane when I was flying there, I sat next to a gentleman and I was talking to him about it and he said, well, what about human obligations? 
You know, so I think going in, all of those thoughts were flowing in my mind about, you know, what am I doing? What does this mean? You know, are these shallow words? Is there depth to it? And to my surprise, I think it really just reaffirmed for me the field that, that I know I want to go into and that it, and in making it something that I realize can have the impact that I thought it could. And for example, I think a few times when I would, um, was in more rural areas, and generally speaking, it was when I was talking to women. You know, these were women that, in many cases, didn't know they had a constitution in their country, and that definitely had not read it. And for centuries, uh, most likely had not been viewed anywhere near equal to their husbands or to their male counterparts in their communities. And seeing the transformation that knowing that this document existed in whatever abstract form it may have seemed for them, but it really empowered them. And, and to hear the words from their mouth and, and some women who became activists in their communities for trying to uphold the rights of, um, of their fellow community members. And I think, I guess it's just so easy coming from a society where we are rights-based and we have so many rights and it's easy to take those for granted but really recognizing that the law, although many people probably think it does just the opposite of uphold justice here, that it really has that potential. And um, as I go into kind of the last phase at the law school as a student there, I think it was really important for me to have that reminder um, that, that there is good that can come from it and that um, it can have a huge impact. Um, so, so I'm very grateful for that. And as far as skills, I think I realized I have a lot to learn in terms of research and that methodology in research is so important. So I know um, I loved doing it and I would like to do it in the future, but I think I need to, um, to spend some time figuring out um, more precise methods, I think, so. Thank you. Ashley. Um, I, this really was a completely transformative experience for me. Um, I never even considered working abroad, even coming to the Clinton School, and Dr. Fitzpatrick can attest to this, I was terrified and worried, and I was like, you know, I'm not gonna fit in, there's no way I'll be able to communicate with people, um, but it really affirmed my abilities. Um, I, I had a really good experience with Habitat, and they seemed very pleased with the um, products that I was able to produce, and I'd never worked with such a large nonprofit, like a huge international nonprofit, and there were all the internal politics that come with that large of an organization. And so that was a really great learning experience for me. It also, I think, sharpened some of my communication skills, because of course language is a large part of communication, but there are also a lot of other small social cues that we all follow every day that you don't think about, um, even what happy is, what excited is, the way you you know, the way that you display these things. I remember one experience. Uh, my program manager was Dutch, and we were on Skype with our the newly hired project manager in Armenia, and we we're super excited because it's been difficult to attract staff there, and we're all so excited. We're like, oh, we're happy to have you on board. You know, it's going to be a good experience. Are you excited? And he looks as in like no smiles, like yeah. <laughs> And it was just flat, and I was like, are you guys, and afterward I'm like, man, you guys aren't paying him enough, are you? Like, he just, he just looks thrilled. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, that's actually pretty excited. That's, that's dang near jumping to the ceiling in Armenia, you know? And one of the staff members was Armenian. And I'm like, and I was like, well, and she had watched the call, and she actually laughed at my reaction. She's like, yeah, I think he seems thrilled. <laughs> And I was like, oh, okay. And so it was just like a, and that's just a small situation where I realized how important communication is. Um, and so you're talking to different people, um, even though he was speaking English, but I still did not pick up on the way he felt about it. You know, in the States, I would have been like, well, obviously this guy, you know, I don't think he's gonna work out. He doesn't seem very excited about the project. But there, that's a perfectly reasonable way to respond to a boss who asks, are you excited to work here? You know, and so um, I think that was probably some of the greatest skills um, that I built. Also, I have an undergraduate degree in sociology, and I haven't flexed those sociology muscles in quite a while, but I wrote a survey um, for part of my project, and so I think that it really built on a lot of my sociological research skills. Um, that was a really great benefit. Um, now I am considering working abroad, which is something that I had never considered, um, and even working with the lawyers that work for Habitat, who practice comparative law and international law, it was really neat. Even though that wasn't my specific focus area, because I was in the office with them, I could learn a lot about a whole new career path that I didn't even know I had. So that was really a great experience for me. 
Thank you, Ashley. Tyler. Um, I can echo the sentiments of my colleagues with the catapulting experience that this was as far as professional development goes. Um, that was definitely the biggest takeaway from it and is the biggest takeaway from all of my time here at the Clinton School so far. I was given a very challenging task, um, one that I was unsure of how to accomplish in the beginning. I did what was in front of me each step of the way, put my 100% into it, and in the end I was uh, very satisfied with my results and so were my partner, was my partner organization. Um, so it gave me a huge boost of confidence. It gave me that, uh, that feeling that, that I can accomplish whatever task is set out in front of me. It made me appreciate um, di diversity in, in, in skill sets. Like I said, uh, value chain analysis and animal husbandry wasn't something that I had a lot of experience with, um, even though I'm from Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I like that, and I know I like that now. I know that um, I like diverse things. I like uh, things I have not done before. So that was very important to me. Um, on top of that, uh, it was, I was an international studies major for my undergraduate, and uh, international work had always been very appealing to me. And so this was my first chance to, to really get involved into some of the things that I had been studying about for several years as an undergraduate and here at the Clinton School. And uh, I had a really, really great perspective in Cambodia because um, they, are, they are truly a, a developing nation. They've experienced a um, very difficult political history in the last 40, 50 years, which uh, destroyed their nation, and they are definitely in the process of rebuilding. Um, I was able to witness a, uh, a national election when I was there, and uh, the campaigning process that went along with that, um, all, all of the political aspects that were involved, all, all the news that was in, in the newspapers, and uh, that was extremely exciting for me to witness, um, an, an emerging democracy, so to speak. Um, They've, they've been holding elections for the past 20 years, and they have it every five years, so I felt very fortunate to be able to, to witness that and to see how that occurred in, in, a, in a developing democracy. Um, their campaigning styles are a little different, actually. They drive around on uh, big trucks, pickup trucks, and they have giant loudspeakers, and they like to come by at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and uh, <laughs> blare out their message as loud as they can. And so it made me appreciate all of the, uh, the commercials that we have here a little bit more, actually. Because <laughs> I can hit mute on those, but I can't. Uh, so, so that was great. Um, as far as working abroad in the future, um, it's still something I, I consider. Uh, like Jessica, I'm from Arkansas. This is, this is my home and where my roots are. And so um, I, I, after about six weeks, you know, I, I was missing my home. I'm very fortunate. Uh, to, to have the situation I have here, and I know that, I really appreciate and value uh, what we have here as a society. And to see the, the stark contrast uh, made me appreciate it even more. And it, whether I'm working abroad or not, um, it, when I'm working here at home, it's gonna give me that much more incentive to appreciate what we have here and to work to improve it further. Thank you, Tyler. Nina. Right, I also echo Tyler and Jessica in terms of the importance of domestic policy. I left an IPSP fairly committed that domestic policy was something I wanted to focus on. So it's a bit anticlimactic, because when I came back from IPSP, I still really liked domestic policy. <laughs> But it did, it really opened me up to a new dimension of myself. Kayla and I would meet these volunteers in um, Kampala and one woman who I had a hard time keeping just a, a tolerable expression on my face. It was quite difficult for me. She just kept going on about, I just can't believe these poor children. Can you believe they don't have health care or they don't have education or they don't have homes? These are homeless children. Can you believe it? Like, yes, I can believe it. And that's also happening in Phillips County. That's also happening in East St. Louis. That's happening in a thousand other places in the United States that I could be working in. Uganda is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, but interacting with so many people abroad that were unaware of the disparities in our own country was a bit disheartening. But personally, my greatest takeaway was this newfound sense of confidence that I have in my skill set. Again, you know, I was an urbanite, and the Clinton School somehow converted me from that into a working professional. Look at this dress. I look like a young professional now. <laughs> 
And um, Kayla and I started this project. We were very, we were very skeptical that in 10 weeks we could produce anything. But it turns out 10 weeks is just enough time to build ownership of your project. It's enough time to have someone fall in love with what you're doing. It's enough time to connect to your community. 10 weeks is enough time to build something feasible in the community when you're working with the individuals who are there. So we fell in love with the own work that we were doing. And if, even if nothing else happened, although our project ended up earning the organization $30,000, so we're pretty proud of that. Thank you. But there's this moment in the conversation where after trekking four hours to meet a woman in a banana plantation, she would say, no one's ever asked me this before. Like, people care about my opinion? And we could confidently say as two unpaid interns, yes, we care about your opinion. <laughs> For nothing else, even without any of the money that we earned, for playing a role in that conversation, for saying that we helped shape some kind of discourse, even if no one else knows about it except for our recorders, in the report that Dr. Fitzpatrick is forced to read now, if nobody else knows about it, like we still shaped something empowering. One individual after speaking to us felt like she was worth more, and that makes every, all the work that we've done at the Clinton School so much better. And if we can produce that high quality work from a remote village with no running water or electricity in a very, in a remote place in the world, then I'm confident I can produce it in Little Rock, Arkansas, or anywhere else I go after this. Thank you for your very uh, candid and, and open comments. Um, do you have any questions for our panel? Yes, please. I'd like to ask. Oh. I'd like to ask uh, how you interpreted public service uh, to the people where you went. I'll answer this one. Um, it was very, very, very difficult to explain what public service was um, and especially what a master's in public service is. The best way that I found to explain it to the culture that I was in is that it's sort of a mix between public administration and public policy with an emphasis on serving the people. And so I would try to use as many examples as possible. For example, the project I was doing, I would tell my coworkers, this project is public service. You all every day are performing public service. And this is the focus of our degree program. And one of the great benefits is the field service portion. But overall, I still couldn't tell you if they actually fully understood what it was. Um, again, it was very challenging, but that's how I found was best to describe it. I don't know, maybe someone else has a different way they used. Anyone else want to comment? Um, I would uh, usually say that it was a combination, uh, you know, a degree that, that was very broad and, and intentionally broad for the purposes of allowing students to go into whatever interest they had, whether it was public, private, nonprofit, and I would usually use those three pillars to try to describe um, the types of fields that students from our, our school go, go into. Um, on top of that, I, I liked leaving it broad because it opened up the conversation for what that means to them. Um, and I had some interesting conversations about that. We've had a lot of interesting conversations about what public service means to us here at the Clinton School in, in Dean DePippa's uh, class uh, our first year, actually. And uh, it's an ongoing conversation for us, I think. Um, and one of the unique conversations that I had about it, um, we kind of came to an agreement that public service is almost any job in society. If, if you're doing something that contributes to the, the greater good, even if it's um, you know, delivering supplies or driving, driving a truck or um, driving a school bus or working in a hospital, if, if you're doing something that is, that is part of, of one of the institutions in our society, then you're a public servant in a way. And uh, that was an interesting insight that I, had, that I remember from my conversations. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Yes, please. Oh, um, there we go. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm curious to know, before you went to your locations, did you do a lot of uh, in-depth research about the circumstances you would be facing there with respect to your particular projects? Or did you pretty much go with an open mind, uh, no preconceived notions, that sort of thing? I got it. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes, there are a number of, uh, there's a structure in place for IPSP and there are a number of assignments that we did have to produce. We had to, aside from getting um, a project approved through our organization and through the school, we had a work plan that detailed week by week the assignments and deadlines for certain activities. We had to conduct a country analysis, which was a brief paper analyzing the things that happened. So my next part of this is for class nine. There's a reason that we have to do that. It's effective and it works and it keeps you on track. Once Kayla and I were in the field, we did not have access to additional resources. We had no access to the internet. We didn't have textbooks or anything like that with us. So all we had to continue our research was, was the research that we'd already conducted prior to leaving. And it kept us on track. We were also in an interesting position because there was another intern for the organization that was based in Kampala, but she was sent out by uh, Columbia University. And she did not have to do any of the same structures. So to me, it was like a mini research project to see the difference of an intern in a similar program who who, had, who didn't have to do the structure and, and me and Kayla who did have to do the structure. And she really didn't produce any work near the end. She was off track. She had several project ideas that had never been fleshed out. She didn't have a work plan. She did not know how to do one. She met with Kayla and I several times to ask us for information and help to doing those things. And these are all things that Kayla and I had done prior to leaving. So it made us, so having another intern there who didn't have to go through the same process only highlighted the importance of doing that research that much more because we were able to see the impact of our work in greater detail as composed to somebody who didn't. Also, my end, in addition to the um, preliminary things that we did for school, I also did a lot of, um, I guess, on my own, trying to find like cultural research. I uh, have a friend who's one of my best friends here is actually from Albania, and her cousin had a roommate who was from Slovakia, mm -hmm. and so I friended them on Facebook and, you know, tried to find as much as I could about the culture because I knew I was going into a new place. Um, I. The project's being piloted in Armenia and in Bosnia, so a lot of the academic work I did on housing structures and cultural you know, biases and things were on those two countries because that's where my project work is going to be focused. But my personal, like day to day, you know, what's rude, what's polite, what should I expect? I did that work on Slovakia since that's exact, that's where I lived and that's where I was housed. And so I actually did just a lot of on the ground research, just talking to anyone I knew that knew anything about Eastern Europe so I could see, you know, what to expect. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a comment? Let's see. I'll just add one thing to that. I think um, no matter, at least for me, you know, with Kenya, it was obviously fairly easy to do a lot of extensive research before going. A lot has been written both politically and historically about the country, but I feel like getting there, and in our office, you know, when we'd have our morning tea, we would have three newspapers circulating, and, and despite all of that, I just wasn't prepared for the complexity of the issues, and especially with all the, the different ethnic groups and the history and all of that. So. So I found it fascinating, no matter how much research you do ahead of time, there's still so much more to try to understand and to try to figure out while you're there, and the importance of, of continuing to be an active learner in that, which is sort of inevitable, I think, with most of these projects, but trying to engage in as many conversations as you can, um, because in, in probably any country we go to, you know, there's a lot of history and it's complex, and so I think you can't really underestimate the importance of that. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Was there one over here? Yeah. Yes. yes. Question about how you plan to follow up with the results of your research, and are you going back to visit? Mm -hmm. Well, I've definitely tried to stay in touch with everyone that I worked with this summer and stay on top of things. As is a part of the culture there, it takes usually about two weeks for someone to get back to me. But it, it is very nice to be able to keep in touch with them via social media and just email in terms of what they're doing with my project deliverables and in terms of just seeing how they are as people because we do form relationships in the workplace that are very meaningful. And I would love to see what they do with my deliverables. I know they're currently translating some of them into Spanish, so that's definitely on the way to helping people who don't speak English be able to use the deliverables. And uh, for the second question, I would absolutely love to go back and visit, and I would love to visit other parts of the country that I wasn't able to see because it is such a diverse landscape. Anybody else? 
Um, I will say I actually just got an email a couple weeks ago. Um, shortly after I left Kenya, the organization I was working with hired an outside consultant who, so whereas I did maybe five case studies, this consultant was trying to hit a broader range. I think they ended up going to 15 or 20 different communities. And um, so I got the report that this consultant did um, about the similar research, and they were just asking for my thoughts on it. So I think it, it's nice to know that that the work continues on in, in some form, um, and I definitely hope to go back. So. And it's interesting, um, all, of, all five of these students are, have been working with partners that we're calling, that we term our long-term partners. So we'll be sending students back to these positions uh, in the summer. So the idea is that the Clinton School will have a continuous interaction with this, these organizations, and that one student's work can build on, on the previous student. So we hope for, one of our goals is to be sustainable, so that whatever um, impact that we have or whatever contribution that we make, it's not just zooming in, zooming out, that we have this consistent presence. That they can count on us as, as well as we count on them to be mentors for our students. Tyler? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm actually still in contact with, with my partner organization. Uh, the deliverable that I produce for them, they plan on uh, publishing it and disseminating it at a, at a national conference in Cambodia, all about agriculture. And uh, so there, there's, it's still kind of an ongoing process for editing and revising the document. And even though I'm technically finished with uh, the requirements asked of me here at the school, uh, I told them that I'm still committed to the project as long as it takes to finish. Um, so, and fortunately for me, their, their office headquarters are here in Little Rock, so I'm hoping they'll come visit me next. <laughs> Yes, John. Lindsay, I've got a, a question for you. You mentioned the parallel legal systems, the formal and informal, and also paralegal. Can you give any examples of where you saw those two systems operating and whether paralegals help bridge the gap? Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, so. I think that paralegals definitely bridge the gap, and I think um, that that was something that uh, LRF, the organization I work with, has recognized for years. And in Kenya, the, the population of actual attorneys is very low. And like I alluded to, most people cannot afford an attorney, nor do they go into a courtroom with an attorney. And so for LRF, by training paralegals, and I guess what I mean when I say that, is these are all volunteers. The organization um, pays very few paralegals legals. So these are community members who have volunteered their time to be trained on existing laws and um, especially with the new constitution, you know, what are the changes, what does that mean? And, um, and in the prison system, these paralegals are there to help inmates, um, help guide them as they prepare to go to court. Um, because they don't have attorneys. And in the community, they're there to help kind of be a liaison between elders and maybe those people in the community who have more quote unquote power, and then um, just your average community members. And so um, I think that, and, and paralegals are also used by many organizations in the country. So I think they're viewed as a tool, as a way of trying to align the informal and formal systems, or, or trying to bridge it might be the better term but um, they were definitely very prevalent and very useful. So. Any other questions, comments? No? Do you, panel, do you have any fi final remarks? Anything you want to leave the audience with? Any gems of wisdom? Uh-oh. Thank, thank, you, thank you all very much for coming today. It's uh, been a pleasure. Thank you very much.